With the release this week of the Whoop Coach for owners and subscribers of the Whoop Band, we are starting to see the rollout of larger scale products using AI. And in this case, the artificial intelligence coach is powered by GPT-4 from OpenAI, and it aims to provide personalized on-demand health and fitness coaching for users. I was interested in the media release when it referenced the cycling industry, saying AI is wearable technology and it follows a trend in, in the cycling industry where AI and machine learning are being used to enhance coaching and training experiences. So it got me thinking about where we are at with AI in cycling and maybe a couple of ideas on what would make cycling better when it comes to AI. But first, the types of questions that you can now ask the Whoop coach include things like, what workout should I do? When was my highest strain? How does my HRV compare to people like me? How do I charge my Whoop? Why am I tired? Am I sick? There was one Twitter user that got recommended a 5x12 chest press, 10 minute air bike, 3x10 ball slams when asked to individualize a workout. So it's not like they're outputting anything too crazy that, and that you couldn't already find. And by the way, I have two tidbits about this world. Firstly, Whoop is really driven by HRV. And there was a paper that came out this week aiming to test whether heart rate variability could reliably indicate training load in professional cyclists, which they found there was no significant correlation between heart rate variability and training load or intensity. Man, that is a bummer. Secondly, you can't talk about HRV without mentioning the Aura Ring. And someone this week, Daniel Yu on Twitter, reverse engineered the Aura Ring's proprietary algorithm readiness score, showing the weight placed on each factor and sleep balance, which is comparing short-term values to long-term values. For example, HRV balance compares two-week HRV average to a three-month average, and the smaller the difference between the short and the long-term, the more the value is considered balanced. So they think sleep is a major factor, which is interesting because they're leaning into sleep more than HRV. Sleep is essential to good performance. It's essential to recovery. It's also super important for your mental state. Cycling at the pro level, the margins are so small between the best and worst rider that often the biggest difference comes from the mental aspect. Okay, back to AI and cycling. Here's my list on what AI could improve in for all of our collective cycling experiences. Training, I think is the first one. I think it would be helpful in training prescription and monitoring and looking as a coach. If I could track things in the background and then I just get pinged when there's something that needs attention, I would be all for that. Also, a way to use my knowledge that I have to guide when making decisions, I would be all for that. Route finding, I think this could be linked to types of rides, whether it is a training ride or not, or it's based on weather or roadworks or real-time updates and route planning could benefit from AI in this way. Nutrition is a big one, and there are some smart companies out there already trying to crack it in the broader world, but the obvious is food planning and fueling strategies, which are my first thoughts around this. And also there's race strategy, which is something that we might see in pro races. Um, we have seen this already a little bit, Team EF and Platypus, for example, but by inputting an entire history of races and riders that you can use to make decisions would really turbocharge the race plans teams come up with. And finally, gear planning. Same could be said for optimal gearing and even clothing decisions. Maybe there will be body scans for bike fits, but even on a level of, say, tire choice or rim depth, this could be aided by AI. But what are your thoughts on this? You got any better ideas than me? With things like Apple working on a similar product to Whoop Coach and the Meta Glasses coming out and potentially kicking off a new way of interacting with AI, what does the future hold for cycling and when? 2030, 2050? Let me know below. Now that I've got that off my chest, on today's show, we have the hot take on the gravel world course. A couple of old dogs, One's last race and the other one, well, we don't know yet. Plus the debate on solo or group rides and plenty of new endurance bikes for non-racers. Hello, I'm Damien Roos and welcome to the Quick Spin Cycling Digest. If you're new here, we gather all the news and views from the net so you don't have to. Links in the description below. Let's roll.
The Last Dance. Peter Sagan's road race career comes to an end this Sunday at Tour de Vondi. Here's a reminder of Sagan at his peak. Racing to victory in the 2015 World Road Championships in Richmond, USA. Later saying this about the effort in his book, My World. This was the one shot race, the one bullet I had been waiting the whole year, my whole career, my whole life to fire. I wasn't going to lose without having tried to win. I wasn't going to die wondering. And that sums it up. Thanks for the memories, Peter. Now, Mark Cavendish, is he going to continue racing in 2024? There is suggestions that it is going to happen. So apparently Mark Cavendish is going to stick around with Astana for a bit longer. Word on the street is that he is eyeing the Tour de France in 2024 and really wants to break that Eddie Merckx record. But hey, negotiations are still happening and it looks like Cavendish will be back in action next season, teaming up with his old buddy, Michael Morkov. Cav will be making his comeback at the presidential tour of Turkey and maybe we'll find out a little bit more then. And also Primoz Roglic is apparently deciding whether to stay with Jumbo Visma or not by this weekend. So if he goes to somewhere like Ineos, we might get to see another quality rider aiming for a tour win, which I am all in for. Now the UCI Gravel Worlds course has been unveiled and it includes double the climbing of last year. Nathan Haas had a balanced take on cycling news saying that last year's mixed reviews and limited resources led to management rights being revoked from PP Sport events. Thankfully, a new course was announced just three weeks before the race, which had everybody scrambling last minute to get things done to make sure they could get to the race. But the new course includes a challenging 46 kilometer stretch towards Pierre del Solgo. It features steep climbs and gravel sectors. The men's elite race covers 169 kilometers with nearly 1,900 meters of elevation, while the women's race covers 140 kilometers with 1,660 meters of elevation gain. And while some riders feel that the course leans towards road suited style, Improvements have been made compared to the last year, and the course is considered selective without being overly challenging. The mix of technical downhills, flat sections, and steep climbs will test gravel specialists and world tour road pros. Riders are considering using smaller, faster tires and fast road bikes due to the significant amount of tarmac on the course. And the potential participation of road and gravel racing scene, putting them together, it really does add intrigue to this event where they all compete for the rainbow drives. And while this race may not fully embody the traditional gravel racing experience, riders appreciate and respect the race because winning a world championship still remains prestigious. So Haas kind of rounds out here saying that it's going to bring excitement with a new course that challenges both gravel specialists and world tour riders. And the addition of a strong USA cycling team adds further competition, setting the stage for a thrilling race. Maybe. Do you prefer to ride alone or with others? That's the topic of the two articles from Cycling Weekly this week. And first, in favour of solo rides. Tom Cousins brings up these points about solo cycling. Number one, freedom to choose your own route. I agree with that. Number two, flexibility with departure time. I agree with that. Number three, set your own pace. Yes. Number four, safety and awareness. Yes. Number five, relaxation and tranquility. Yes. Number six, personal growth and challenge. I agree with all of those, but I'll tell you a bit more later on. But to which Michelle Arthur's Brennan replies, I'd choose the club ride over going solo any day. Shots fired for that side. Now, I don't know what side you sit on, but her main argument is that solo riding is a needs must solution to maintaining adequate fitness. So it's like the necessary evil for her. Uh, for the real joy is where the memories are made, saying that all of her great cycling memories have been with company and that club rides, team rides, group rides and rides with friends, whatever they are, are the lifeblood of our sport. Without knowing them, how would we school beginners in the art of nonchalant half-wheeling? On a more serious note, how would we identify and develop new talent? So what about you? Besides the times when you don't have a choice to ride alone or with a group, what do you choose and why? Me, I'm a solo type rider. Group rides 
mix it up occasionally and they're good for new locations, but I've always just wanted to set my own pace, listen to my music and get inside my own head rather than listen or smell anybody else. New bikes, they are called endurance bikes, but maybe there is a better name to represent the non-competitive nature of the rider that will use them. If you've got a better name, let me know. Anyway, there are three different takes on the endurance bike. First with the Pinna Dogma X. This new endurance range moves more into the comfort side of things, which means new geometries, wider tires, tire clearances, up to 35 millimeter tires, increased vibration absorption, and the X stays concept for comfort. The split is said to be 80% performance, 20% comfort. And one thing the design takes into consideration is not requiring excessive spaces or upsizing frames, which is a big win for anyone that's been forced to ride with spaces and the shame of just not looking cool. Now, the main standout of the design is those stays, called X stays, consisting of vibration dampening carbon layup and X shaped bridge. Between the seat stays, the X-Series bikes incorporate Flexi Stays 2.0, offering vibration-absorbing comfort through their slim and arced seat stays. And of course, we have internal cable routing for a hard-to-service and transport bike. And another non-race road bike, this time from Pearson. Pearson's new Forge road bike, which took a different approach to design, mainly because it has been designed based on data collected from years of custom bike fits. And again, it prioritizes comfort and positioning over performance. And part of this is the size range offered by Pearson, which has a significant amount of overlap, allowing riders to find a better fit compared to mass market bikes that have often limited size options. And according to Pearson, their five sizes should fit approximately 85% of riders with custom and other models available for those who fall outside of this range. The Forge's geometry chart shows that it has a shorter reach and sits slightly higher compared to many other bikes. Not the bikes I'm talking about today though. It has full internal cable routing and 700 by 35 tire clearance. And the Forge road bike is available for pre-order with prices ranging from 5,000 to 8,000 depending on the chosen group and wheels. Finally, on the more performance side of the performance comfort matrix, Giant has recently launched their fifth generation Defy endurance road bikes, which they claim are now lighter, smoother, and more efficient than ever before. Giant say the design of the Defy Advanced prioritizes rider comfort with a focus on touch points and tires. It doesn't feature an integrated seat mast, but uses a defuse seat post for better compliance. And the geometry is basically the same as the other two bikes on the show, but it is more of a climbing bike because the comfort work is done by the seat post and the handlebar flex absorbing impacts and the tires filtering out road vibrations rather than some fancy frame design. And finally, how's this? State Bicycle Co. introduces an all-road suspension fork. This kind of brings me back to the 90s when I bought my first RockShox Quadra fork, an aftermarket fork for my mountain bike, which I bought as a hardtail. And it feels exactly the same when making the kind of considerations that you have around what to buy next for, say, your gravel bike. But they recently launched this all-road suspension fork and everyone's saying it's a game changer for gravel adventures, but I'm not so sure of that. This fork offers comfort, yeah, and control on rough terrain, yeah, and it's got a clean design, yes. Does it add sophistication to your gravel bike? I'm not so sure. Maybe people still aren't into these types of additions. It weighs 1600 grams, so it won't weigh you down. Has 40 millimeters of travel, is that enough? It absorbs all the bumps while maintaining speed. Quick and painless installation, of course, it's a fork. So, I don't know. Is it worthwhile? I, right now, wouldn't put it on my bike. I don't think it would add anything that I couldn't just, I don't know, let down my tire pressure a little bit for. But hey, I'm not really riding some crazy tracks with heaps of big gravel boulders and things. So maybe there is still potential there and I'm just being really negative and pessimistic on adding things you don't need to gravel bikes. But anyway, it's out there, it's $450 US. If this is something you're into, I'm not gonna judge you, but I probably won't do it. And that's it for our quick spin around the world of cycling. Ride well, and I'll catch you next time.